Good morning. I'm surprised so many of you are here. I'm not going to lie to you. It's the third day. Everybody's brains are leaking out their ears. The hotel sleep is real good. It's all right. Thank you for joining me. Um, so these are my kids. This is Gus on the, on the left there. He's 13. And this is Ingrid. She's 10. And uh, for a really long time, we've had this tradition on Friday nights where we have pizza and movie night. And we've done this since they were really little. No, you are using this shtick as an excuse to show cute pictures of your kids. <laughs> so at any rate, here's how this goes. Uh, we'll have our pizza, and then we sit down, and we all snuggle in on the couch. And we have to have pizza first, because you can see there's no food in the TV room. And uh, we open it up. Okay, what does everybody want to watch? And inevitably, Ingrid wants to watch Truman Show. This is her favorite movie. She wants to watch it every freaking Friday. And Gus, on the other hand, at 13, has recently sort of discovered that life is painful and suffering. And so he's gotten into like darker foreign films with subtitles, like A Man Called Ova, which is what he wanted to watch last weekend. <laughs> so. Gus and Ingrid start going at it, and I'm like, all right, all right, let's open up the floor. So, you know, we go on to Amazon, and we start looking, and we're looking, and we're like, maybe we should watch a TV show. What about a comedy? We're watching all these previews, nothing. So then we go over to Netflix, and Gus is like, Ingrid, you never want to watch anything. And Ingrid's like, why can't we just watch the Truman Show? And pretty, pretty soon, you know, there's like just total throwdown battle. And I'm like, listen, you guys, if you can't decide, we're all going to take our individual screens and go off to other corners of the house and just watch our own thing. And then Ingrid starts crying, and Gus feels guilty, and we end up watching the Truman Show. So let's, let's sort of like see what had to happen there to get our family aligned. We had to ideate. We had to debate. There was appeasement. There was the decision. And then lots of pouting. This process reminds me of most content reviews that I sit through. <laughs> uh, this is a content review meeting. You can tell by how deeply engaged everyone is in it. So uh, we, you know, what happens in our content and our design review meetings? We call everybody in. We sit down. We present our artifacts. They go. They look. They provide feedback. Pretty soon, everybody's kind of talking over one another. Uh, you know, everybody's got their own kind of politics and agenda and whatever. And this, as Brad Frost will tell you, is exactly how we end up with carousels on the home page as appeasers to keep everyone from beating the shit out of each other. <laughs> So at this point, I'd like to introduce to you the concept of alignment, not necessarily as a state of being, but as a process, as a process that we return to again and again throughout our project process. So what is alignment? Uh, how do we get there? When the sky is the limit for everything that we are designing and creating, how is it that we are able to pull people together so that we are all reading from the same playbook? Well. Here are a couple definitions of alignment. We have agreement or cooperation among a group with a common cause. This sounds like our project team. This sounds like our small company. This sounds like our client, uh, supposedly. And then alliance is also, alignment is also a position of agreement or alliance. So OK, so we've got these three states. We have cooperation, alliance, and agreement. And in the absence of these three states, what do we have? We have conflict. So in order to deal with conflict or to prevent conflict, what we need to do is we just need to have lots of check-ins and get everybody sort of on the same page and to agree to things at these important milestones, right? So this is actually wrong. This is a mindset that sort of creates death by a thousand cuts, where collaboration very, very quickly kind of turns into consternation and just sort of continual nitpicking at decisions and at uh, our iterations and so on. So what I'd like to propose is that alignment is actually something that can happen before conflict. It can't necessarily prevent conflict, but it is something that we do to lay the foundation and the groundwork so that we can agree from the very beginning of the project process or as we introduce the concept of alignment into our working process day to day, that this is something that we are continually pursuing, we're continually resetting, and that we need to prepare for it uh, as soon as possible to create that foundation. So 
as we go through our ongoing cycle of creation and iteration and build and launch and measurement and so on, just remember throughout this talk, don't stop aligning. Also, don't stop believing. <laughs> I love you, Steve Perry. Okay, so for simplicity's sake, let's take a look at the tools of alignment in the context of the project process. I love you, Steve Perry. Uh, we'll talk about project preparation, assessment and analysis, strategy, design and build, and launch and beyond. I want to acknowledge that many of you don't have the luxury of working on the project on a project process. Um, you have the luxury of working within the agile process, or you just have day-to-day -day tasks that you're sort of mired in, trying to move the ball uh, down the field. Not mired in, inspired by. Um, and so my hope, though, is that in talking about it in this framework, we'll still be able to come together to understand some of the tools, understand some of the ways that people think and make decisions, and walk away with some ideas and some processes that will empower you to continually seek alignment among your team members or members of your company. Okay, so preparation. So there's this great article called The Management of Differences by Schmidt and Tannenbaum, I'm dropping some consultant knowledge on you there, that says the four primary reasons for conflict are that we are not aligned on values, goals, our methods, or actual facts. So as we think about it, I want to talk through these four issues, and I want us to consider that these are not necessarily things we need to prevent conflict within, but that we need to align on early and often. So let's start with values. Uh, many of you probably have company values. I've seen a lot of people with name badges where the values are like printed on the back and there are things like passion and accountability and teamwork and so on. Uh, these values sort of repeat themselves. This is a diagram of values that has basically lorem ipsum in them and here is a uh, template for core values. So if anybody's missing them, you can just search for core values on Google and pull some up and you'll be all set. So what I want to do is I want to talk for a minute about the difference between beliefs and values. Belief itself is something that is context dependent. This is something that uh, has been shaped by our upbringing, by our experiences. Beliefs inform your worldview and really can shape your perceptions around circumstance, around how other people are behaving, and around what is motivating other folks. Beliefs are dangerous sometimes in that they lead to assumptions, and we'll talk about assumptions in a little bit. On the other hand, values are, concept, are concepts that transcend context. Values are something that we are able to hold to, that are, is able to shape our behavior, no matter what the context, who we're dealing with, what the conflict, what the challenge. Values are something that really define who you are and what is important to you in life and work. So, uh, one company that got a lot of play for its values early on was uh, Zappos, and this is Zappos CEO, Tony Shea, and these are the first five of their values. So these are things that no matter what else is going on, no matter what challenge they have, no matter what conflicting beliefs exist within the organization, these are things that everybody is to be aligned on, deliver wow through service, embrace and drive change, create fun and a little weirdness, and so on. So. Sometimes these larger corporate organizational higher admission values or whatever uh, can be difficult to sort of play out within the context of our day-to-day -day work so that even though they are transcending that context, something like accountability is going to mean something different to your team than it would to like HR or the CEO necessarily, right? So in that instance, I encourage you uh, to think about sort of translating or further refining these values so that they exist within your own teams and they're very meaningful to your teams. If you are on your own in your organization or if you have a small organization, take the time to sit down and define these values. Uh, there's something that are uh, powerful in terms of getting you up in the morning, in terms of ensuring that people are aligned on why we're doing the work that we're doing. As an owner of a consulting firm, I share those values on our website, and this is something that resonates with clients. They sort of help determine, like, this is the kind of person and the reason that I am and the reason that our team is doing this 
work. The other thing I want to encourage you to do is to share those values with the rest of the organization, especially in content strategy, which is such a new uh, discipline within so many organizations. Content strategy teams or content strategists coming together, defining those values and sharing them on a regular basis, um, whether it's a sign up in their area or in their cubicle. Sometimes if they're doing presentations to say, here's what I do, they share those values. It's really, really powerful to get people aligned on why we are doing the work that we are doing. Okay, so now let's talk about goals. So everybody has goals, even if you haven't articulated those goals or the people who are in charge have not articulated those goals, those goals are there. So part of our job is to understand what those goals are and to work to articulate them and to make sure that we are clear on them. Uh, let's talk about the nature of a good goal versus a bad goal. Here's a goal. We will launch a fully responsive website that engages our target audiences and provides the foundation for rapid cross-platform innovation. Anyone? Anyone have this goal? Or did you have this goal? So this is actually a crappy goal. And the reason that this is a bad goal is that it is more of a vision. It is an overarching desire. It is something that is difficult to measure to say, yes, we have accomplished this. A good goal... This is a pretty standard, I don't know if you guys have seen this before, this is a pretty standard um, framework that actually is adopted by a lot of uh, performance team, teams that I've seen in terms of measuring their performance, uh, that a goal needs to be smart, it needs to be measurable, it needs to be actually attainable within a, time, a frame of time, and it needs to be relevant to the business's goals and our audience and user needs. Oh, look at that, smart goals, right? You guys wide awake enough to see that? I know you are. Okay, so we take our bad goal, and let's see if we can transform it into a good goal. Uh, so now we have three goals. We have time-framed, end of next year. We have a website that can be tested and measured to be, see if it is fully responsive. We have a website content design that meets our new brand standards, okay, and that can be evaluated, that is relevant to the business, and that it meets usability testing requirements based on user-centered design principles, okay? So now this is a good goal, this is a concrete goal, this is something that is smart, it is uh, something that we can all pull together on, and it is something that can drive both strategy and our project objectives. So. When I was listening to uh, Daniel's presentation yesterday, and he was describing sort of that early iteration of the Zero app, and they were having trouble sort of seeing what it was that the CEO wanted, or that the, the guy that was driving the app wanted, and they sat down and they started prototyping and they started doing requirements, and it was effective because it was two people who worked well together, right? This is not something that is always the case within our teams or organizations or clients. And so what I would like to propose is that before we sit down with an idea and start iterating that we specifically talk about those goals for our product, for our website, um, whatever, whatever it is, that we say, here's what this is going to do for our organization, here are the goals it's going to meet for our users, here are some time constraints that we are going to place, like the week or the five days that Daniel talked about. Um, that's enormously effective into helping us move forward and keeping us aligned along the way in what we're working towards. Okay, let's talk methods. So we've been talking about a lot of methods for the last two days around design and build and uh, process and so on. One of the methods I find that we sort of tend to skip over in our working process together in our team process and ad as we collaborate is what our method is behind making decisions. So this is something, to, uh, this is an amazing exercise to be able to step back, whether it's at the beginning of a project process or as a team, to step back and to say, how is it that we are making these decisions? What, what standards are we using? What process are, is, are we using? Uh, and to really dig into that, because this, digging into these questions oftentimes will unearth all kinds of assumptions, all kinds of biases that exist within our own team, sometimes even that exist within ourselves. So let's start about, uh, let's start with actually the role of the decision makers uh, within the project process or within our working process. So there are basically four ways in which decisions get made. We have consensus, where we work until everyone agrees. 
We have command, where we have the super decider, or the super vote, right, that sort of at the end says, okay, this is what we're going to do. We have council, which is where we have kind of representatives from different areas of our business or the design team or whatever come together into sort of a council of representatives and agree on a way forward. And then we have ad hoc, which is where everybody's just kind of making their own decisions and we hope that uh, it sort of comes together in the end, which it really does. So let's look at and measure sort of the effectiveness of these different kinds of decision making. There are two things that we want to think about as we are working towards our uh, decision-making process. What is the strength and longevity of the solution? And what is the speed of decision-making? I will say that one of the things, just as an example, the Agile process is unparalleled in terms of speed and output. However, what we find is that when we try to introduce content into the Agile process, unless it is specifically for a product build, if you're using Agile to build a website, for example, the strength and longevity of those solutions is often compromised simply because we haven't done a lot of the work on the front end around gathering and aligning on things like facts, assumptions, risks, uh, specific user information needs, and so on. And that's a longer process that can take time. So there, we are really sort of sacrificing one thing for speed, right? And as you look here, you can kind of see where the sacrifices are being made. And depending on value, like move fast and break things, that might be OK. Although I will say <laughs> the Facebook, that's Facebook's famous value is move fast and break things when the content strategy team introduced themselves uh, or started to grow and they were within the organization and were introducing themselves to the organization. One of their mottos that they put on a uh, poster was slow down and fix your shit. <laughs> <laughs> OK, the next thing that we want to look at are roles within our decision-making process. Now, I want to acknowledge, if you are a three-person company, that you may not, you obviously can't have an individual assigned to each of these roles, but like it or not, individuals within the company have assumed or are working or, or are acting as one of these roles. Uh, so honor, sponsor, owner, sponsor, manager, product team, uh, subject matter experts, and then everybody else. I love you, Steve Perry. So, you guys familiar with the RACI chart? This is when I first saw, I, I have a real aversion to, sign, to sort of like lame consulting, blue sky framework, blah, 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 Gartner, Forrester, whatever. But every once in a while I come across something, I'm like, oh, this really makes sense. And the RACI chart is something that we have used over and over and over again in our project process and that has proved really invaluable, especially as we move uh, through the process and decisions come more quickly and tempers start to flare and the pressure is on to be able to return back and say, listen, we are, our job is to keep you informed of this process, uh, but you, you know, you're not, you, you don't get to be consulted. Of course, we have to have somebody else say that because as a vendor, if I say that, I get in a lot of trouble. So responsible for completing the task, accountable for the work being done and successful, someone who needs to be consulted, whose input is important to the work, and then people who absolutely must be kept informed of the work. So. As you are putting, this is kind of what this might look like in the content strategy process. We know that throughout, somebody's got to own the content inventory. Somebody needs to be responsible for the messaging architecture. Somebody has got to be responsible for doing page tables. And then somebody has to, has to be responsible for seeing through the web writing. And then we have the roles here. And we've just simply mapped it out. And this is enormously useful for our project teams. Uh, sometimes you can put names on them and that's always lovely. Sometimes your name is on every single one of them, and for that, I wish you well. Okay, so, methods on decision-making, let's move on facts. Sometimes it can be difficult to agree on what the relevant facts are as we're making decisions about our product and designing our product. What are they, how are we going to occur, uh, confirm them, and what assumptions are we comfortable moving forward with? 
And this is where we move into the second part of our project process, which is the assessment and analysis. There are a million questions that we can ask and that should be asked that will help unearth those facts that are most relevant to our decision-making processes. Um, but I, real quickly, I want to talk about the difference between assessment and analysis. Assessment is something that actually catalogs your findings. This is uh, largely a quantitative effort. It can include things like user research, understanding business goals and strategy, um, analytics, uh, the sort of competitor trends or activities or campaigns or whatever um, products. That this is literally something that just sort of captures all in one place the information that is most relevant to the design choices that you will be making throughout the process. It can be enormous. I just worked on a small website with a, with a local firm that had the copy had sort of gone through one million iterations because the team had never sat down together and said, there are 10,000 things that could influence our choices on the content for this website. We're going to commit to these six as being the relevant facts that will inform our decisions. That was really able to help them focus in and make decisions about content instead of that kind of death by a thousand cuts. So I was already going to talk about this, and then I was sitting uh, at breakfast with a team yesterday, and they said, you know, one thing that we did, and it was an internal team that we'd never done before, is we actually, instead of inviting everybody to these huge working sessions for our design iterations, we decided we were going to do individual one-on-one -on -one stakeholder interviews. And it was truly one of the most, they said it was one of the most powerful things that had happened within their project process. Um, sometimes when I'm looking for images on Google, I get lazy and uh, use stock images, so just ignore that. Um, although one nice thing about Google Images, then, then you can search for it and a similar one comes up. I think that is hilarious. <laughs> Actually, the secret that you guys don't know is that uh, most speakers spend about 20% of their time on their actual talk substance and 80% of the time looking for hilarious images on Google. <laughs> So this, I will give you guys a close-up look at this in a minute. Um, one of the most, here, I'm going to come back to the interview real quick. One of the most important things in the alignment process, let's go back, is the stakeholder interview in that very early on, or at any point in the project process, it helps people feel informed, involved, and heard. One of the biggest challenges with getting people aligned or on the same page is that people is the question of why wasn't I consulted? And you all know this person. This is the person that sits quietly in the corner during reviews like this. You know, they don't, they, you say, how's this looking to you? And they're like, it's fine. And then after launch, they'll come back and say, you know, I did not agree with this, this, or this, or this needs to be fixed, or you didn't ask for my input here. Whereas, if you were able to go and sit with that person in the room and give them a one-on-one -on -one audience for 20 minutes, half an hour, and really work hard to listen, not to sort of state your position, not even to make it a two-way conversation, but to say it is important to me or to our team that we understand and hear your perspective. This is where empathy comes in. As we are working through the des our designing, our designing products, Oftentimes, the conflict that can arise really is coming from a place where people are making assumptions around each other's motivations. And that people have stopped talking to each other, and that we've fallen into bad habits with how we're communicating with each other, or that we're in a corporate uh, culture where open communication is just simply not welcome. And every single one of you can open up that door to more honest, uh, communication simply by, again, listening, sitting down and giving people the opportunity to talk. The other thing is that that builds trust. I mean, think about it. If you meet somebody new and they're totally interested in you and asking a ton of questions and nodding and listening, you like that person. You begin to trust that person because you feel that that person really cares about you. So even though the interview ostensibly is to help us gather relevant facts to understand what's going to inform our decision-making processes, even more, it is laying the foundation for alignment along the way. So this is, I cannot stress enough to you. Oh, here's my watermark again. There you go. Okay, so 
at some point in time, if you are going to reach out beyond sort of your team, or if there are people who are influencing the design process who you're not necessarily working with on a day-to-day -day basis, at some point, it's going to be really important for you to understand the role of that individual or of that team and the impact that they have on what's, what's manifesting in your design and in your content choices. So if you are coming to a project uh, as a services team, as a freelancer, uh, one of the things that you can do is go to your client, whether it's external or internal, and say, I need to understand more about the people that I'm going to be interviewing, or I need to understand more about the folks who will be at this workshop. Uh, so this is like the safe space conversation, <laughs> right? Like this is not a document that is necessarily to share with the rest of the team. This is specifically for your own edification, where we want to understand what are the roles of these individuals within our project or working process. And then we want to understand what type they are. Are they strategic? Do they have a larger overview and a more holistic sense of what's going on within uh, the organization, what the goals are, not only sort of at a higher level, but also with the different teams that may have an impact on the design or content process? Um, are they an expert? Are they a subject matter expert? Um, are they somebody who's going to be on the front lines really doing the work, or are they a user proxy in terms of being able to, or the, these are the people that really understand, have done the research, have spoken with, uh, have looked at the analytics, and who understand what users need and how they're behaving. So, and then we've got Jane's name there. So in, the so in the interview process then, we want to understand, okay, what is it that we need to find out from this person? What are their top concerns going to be? And what is going to sell them on this project? Because that's another opportunity in sitting down and listening, is that if we can understand what their concerns are and what's driving them, we also have an opportunity to sort of gently give the project pitch or the design pitch or to say, oh, I'm glad that that came up. Here's something that we're doing to address that. We look forward to your ongoing feedback. Um, one thing I want to warn you about when you were in these interviews, and one thing that uh, in workshops that I give, we do a solid half hour on the interview skills, is that, again, that listening is so critical. This is not an opportunity for you to come in and sort of present your case or an opportunity for you to come in and, and uh, necessarily say, here, here are all the things that are going on that affect you. This is really about them being able to share and to ask you questions as needed. Uh, here is another tool that I use, and this is small, but you should have it on your screens, which is I ask the project owner to send an email around to the stakeholders or to the teams, giving them an early opportunity to sort of literally say, what do you do, what keeps you up at night, and what does success look like to you? This is also one of the most revealing things uh, that I have found within any uh, design project, is that people really will open up if they, if they don't do it in the interview, they'll open up via email, and then you have, if you don't have time to interview folks, this is still a wonderful way to gather information. So finally, in the interview, this is what you want to offer them. Uh, <laughs> I know you're so busy. Thank you for taking the time to meet with me. Uh, revisit those project goals that have been documented and that folks are aligned on. Let them know the current status of the project. Let them know clearly why you need their help and what their role is on the project. And then let them know what's going to happen after the interview. Now, as you're in the interview, I'm going to ask you to think a little bit differently about the information that's being shared. Because oftentimes, what's being shared are not all facts. Sometimes they're simply somebody's perception of the facts. And it is always so interesting to hear, this is one of the things that I love most about my job as a content strategist, is that content is something that is touched by a lot of different people, a lot of different tools and technologies, and being able to go around and hearing perceptions from the UX team, the editorial team, communications, marketing, SEO, analytics, tech, is so fascinating because uh, it's sort of my job in the analysis, which I'll talk about in just a second, to pull all of those different perceptions together and sort of help define, okay, here's the project environment in which we're moving forward. So do we feel like uh, people within the interview are learning and know all of the rele uh, relevant information to our product or process? And do they accept or reject that information as true? Fake news. Um, <laughs> And then, <laughs> sorry. And then, how do they view their authority or power on this project? Okay. 
I want to pause here for just a moment because I know that there is there are a portion, there's a portion of you who are like, my God, this is going to totally change the way that I think about how I talk to my stakeholders and my users. And there's another portion of you that are either like, I work by myself in my house and I never get to talk to anybody or there are three people within my organization and, and uh, why would I ever interview them? But if nothing else, what I'd like for you to think about is that these are listening skills that you can bring to your conversations. These are ways in beginning to understand how your team is making decisions, why they're making those decisions, and really working together to get aligned on what the facts are that are informing those decisions. So the other pieces that you're going to want to cover in this assessment, and again, this is something you can do at any point in time. It doesn't need to be in the context of a project. You want to be sure that you are really clear on business objectives. We had a... <laughs> We had a, uh, it was supposed to be a content strategy workshop and working session with a really big company and we ended up at about halfway through the, the session, they were like, this really feels more like a business strategy meeting and why are we talking about all this? And I was just like, because you have not articulated your goals clearly. So, you know, if I, I really encourage you to sit and think, okay, what are our goals? And if you can't identify them clearly or if they're not good goals, go back and ask for revisions or say, here's an opportunity I think would be really cool for our team to work on together. Any business constraints? I find that business constraints are something that leadership doesn't like to talk about very much unless it's budget, right? They're, they're just like, okay, well, yeah, time. You think time is a constraint, but whatever, I need this at this point. Or uh, people, human power, um, politics that are at play, initiatives that are stalled elsewhere within the organization that will inform our decisions along throughout the design process. These constraints need to be talked about. Uh, whether or not we're able to document them, I would prefer that you would, but if they can at least be acknowledged, then one thing that we can do is we can talk about assumptions and risks. We say, okay, our assumption is that we only have six weeks to complete this process. Here are the risks in terms of the things that we may not be able to deliver on time or uh, you know, that launching this thing in beta may you know, have this kind of risk, whether it's legal or um, otherwise. But being able to identify those and document those within the assessment is really important. Your audience goals, which... Um, Hopefully, you've been able to do some research or talk to your audience or understand where they're coming from, what their requirements are, their desires, their hopes, what delights them, et cetera, and then your project environment, which is largely information you'll gather from your stakeholders as well as any sort of external research that, uh, that you've conducted. Okay, so then here's the difference with the analysis. The, neither of these need to be big, huge, long documents, by the way. They can be briefs, they can be decks, they can be brain dumps, bullet notes. There's no, you don't need to be formal about this. It totally depends on your company culture and what your uh, time frame and resources are. But the analysis is where you get to think about all this stuff and be strategic about all this stuff and pull it together and sort of say, here's what matters and here's what's real. And this is something that people can't do in a vacuum necessarily. There should be some sort of a core team that sort of offers up this analysis, but it is the output of this analysis uh, that helps us set priorities throughout the rest of our design work and our content work to say, here's the reality from which we are making our decisions. It's really, really critical. And then this is an opportunity for alignment. Right? Because people, we need to get people to agree on the same reality, or else we're all going to be making decisions that are continuing to combat one another, and that conflict is going to be difficult to navigate. Okay. All right. So we want to try to get sign off on that stuff at some point to have our working session to agree on what the facts are uh, before we start with our design and our build, or before we move forward with that, before our next sprint, uh, in the middle of our next sprint, wherever it may fit, okay? All right, let's talk about strategy just a little bit. So strategy, on my mind, is something that if, if you do have the luxury of sort of stepping back and working through this as a longer process, this has got to come on the heels of analysis within like days. In fact, we usually will just deliver strategy along with the analysis as part of it. And what strategy does, it is essentially revisits sort of those four big conflicts 
uh, reasons for conflict and ties them all together with a way forward. It's very cool. So the other most important thing that strategy does is it provides us with constraints. We are going to choose a direction in which to take our product, our website, and we are going to use that direction to act as constraints about things that we will do and that we won't do. And this is so critical for alignment because what happens is the quicker we go, this is where we get feature creep, right, scope creep. We're like, oh, this would be cool, and this would be cool, and this would be cool, without any sort of strategy uh, providing us with those guardrails around, these are our primary user needs, these are our primary business goals and opportunities. Let's stay within those guardrails because it's going to help us move more quickly and be more effective. So there are... Uh, sort of three different kind of what Ruma, Richard Rumot calls kernels of strategy. I recommend his book called uh, Good Strategy, Bad Strategy. No matter what you do, it's an outstanding read. Uh, which is the diagnosis, which is essentially your analysis, guiding principles, which we'll get to, and a coherent set of actions. And it is these three pieces that make up your strategy. And without one of these pieces, you don't have a strategy, you have a good idea. Okay? So, again, your diagnosis is basically your analysis, giving a read of the environment, telling people, here's what's true. Your guiding principles are these four things, values and goals, which we've already talked about, your purpose statement, and your prioritized audience. So let's do a health check on these project goals. Based on what it is that we have learned through our assessment and analysis, we want to revisit these and make sure that they are smart and realistic and attainable and measurable and time-framed, OK? We just want to make sure that after we've done sort of this fact-finding journey that everything still makes sense. So then we want to talk about a purpose statement. And a purpose statement is different from project goals or from our team goals in that it talks about what our thing that we are designing and building is, exists to do. So this is always sort of an interesting exercise to go through because a lot of people are like, our website exists, for example, our website exists to, uh, you know, um, inspire brand loyalty among the masses and to establish us as a thought leader in our industry is blah, blah, blah. No, it doesn't. It exists to help you, you know, increase leads. Right? Or it exists to uh, help people get the information they need quickly and when they need it so they'll quit calling the customer care center. Like those are the purposes behind your product and, uh, and the business purposes. And uh, also, you know, we can look at our user purpose behind that product or behind that website. So why does this exist? Not necessarily what does it, uh, what are our project or our working team goals? Okay. Identifying your priority audiences is an, a whole huge other talk that I wish I could give today, but I only have 22 more minutes. Um, what I want to encourage you to do is everybody, if you have, if your audience is everyone, I really want to, unless you are the government, uh, <laughs> or Google, I really want to encourage you to take a step back and work hard to identify, and this is a really useful exercise, literally list out every single audience for your product that you can think of, and then work together as a team, not just to say, okay, here are our priority audiences, but here are our prioritized audiences. Who's most important? Who are those most important two or three core audiences? And then who are our secondary audiences? And who are our tertiary audiences? I'm all, it is always amazing to enter in three quarters of the way through a massive website redesign project and to see that there are 14 user personas that have not been prioritized whatsoever. I mean, no wonder decision making is all over the map and they have a website that's kind of trying to be everything to everyone which means, of course, ultimately, that it's not a whole lot to anyone. So those make up your guiding principles. Your coherent set of actions, then, are here's what we're going to do moving forward to get this design and build done. And it is that roadmap that rounds out, then, your strategy. So let's talk about the design and build process. I'm going to show you a slide that has even more words than many of my other slides. But I want you to have this to walk away with this because these are the key principles of user-centered design. 
And what I'd like to propose to you is that throughout your working process on your teams, uh, with your stakeholders, with your clients, that you begin to consider them as your user, that you are designing products in your deliverables and artifacts for these folks as your user. That is also going to help you keep things aligned because you will be using, and you hopefully have established, sort of shared lexicon for when you say wireframe, here's what we mean. When we say, uh, when we say sprint, here's what we mean. When we say user journey map, here's what we mean. Uh, and that then you are designing those artifacts specifically for your audience. That is really, really key to help a project go smoothly. So as you are delivering these things, make sure that you're asking, is this working for you? Is this communicating the things that you need communicated? This is a huge thing within content strategy because we're creating deliverables for the UX team, for communications, for the CMS folks, for product teams. Uh, and it's important, you know, messaging architecture for one team may not look the same as for another. So these are some key principles that I would encourage you to think about. Okay, design and build. Now we return to our appropriately multicultural design team with the white guy in the middle. Um, and every collaborative like slide like this that I find has this. Um, and what happens then is we sit down and we've done sort of early stages and we've got our strategy and we've got our principles, we've got our values, we've gone forth, we've done our card sorts, we've done our user journey, we pull it together and from a content strategist we sit down and we sort of do early content deliverables and inevitably what happens is somebody is just like, oh man, we're going to need a whole lot more content, so much more content, we thought we had the content, we don't have it, where are we going to get it? I have heard this come at me since I started doing web copywriting in 2000, probably 18 million times, and it always comes in the 11th hour when there's like $4 left for budget. And what I used to do is I used to just be like, well, you know, we talked about this and we did all, these research, all this research and this was the site map that you gave me and now you're giving me this other one, it's the 11th hour and blah, 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 and I'd get super defensive about it. And what I really want to encourage you to do, because it's hard when you've done really great work, when you've worked within those constraints, when you have been operating from what you thought was the right playbook that people had aligned on and had agreed on, and then you get somebody coming back at you going, oh, no, didn't I tell you we have a whole new brand campaign launching in third quarter. You're going to need to redesign the whole thing and rewrite all the microcopy, right? When you feel that desire to just be like, Arr! instead, I really want to encourage you to sort of like just sit back and listen and then work to clarify what, where they're coming from, what the needs are, what has changed, what this is going to do in terms of risks, and how this might change assumptions for your uh, work outcome. Uh, so you want to just be absolutely sure that you understand where they're coming from. And we have something that we actually aligned on early in the process which were these, right? Our values, our goals, our methods, and our facts. So now, because hopefully these have been documented somewhere, you can actually sit down with the person or the team who's sort of swooped in and say, okay, well, these are, here's where I was operating from. Please help me understand what exactly has changed. And these are the questions that we can ask. Uh, how are our goals actually holding up? Where is it that we need to shift gears? And what new thing has come up that is still relevant to our goals? Because that, I think, is another thing, too. People hear about a new initiative or about a change, and it sort of triggers them, and they're like, ah, this has to manifest somehow in this thing that we are creating or building. But sometimes those facts aren't actually relevant to the work that you're doing, and it's just somebody freaking out. This is, again, how like, our home pages become like total like territorial wars because somebody's like, oh, I just talked to a customer and this is what was important to them and we need to change the entire carousel. Okay, so if things fall apart, if you are suddenly find yourselves uh, hung out to dry or thrown under the bus or somebody you know who is core to your team quits or leaves or things fall apart, Something that's really important to do is to, again, 
don't worry necessarily about everybody agreeing and getting along and being happy, but we want to work hard to maintain a mutual understanding of what's important and why. And that means that we need to work together to identify joint objectives, joint communication, joint resources, and joint risks. I'm sorry, joint commitments. So this is actually, if you guys can take a couple of hours with your team to sit down and work through this stuff, I have a handy little worksheet for you. It can be enormously useful in getting everyone sort of reinvested and realigned in terms of understanding what are the things that we share and where do we fall on that spectrum of responsibility. So here's that list where we're talking about um, with our objectives, describe uh, concretely what should be achieved together as a team, contributions, what is it that people need to contribute as a team, and so on. Work through this together, and when you come out of, it, of the process, you'll find, again, that everybody has sort of had their input, they've had their say, they've had their opportunity to reflect upon their role within the process, um, and there will be a new level of alignment coming out. And this can happen at any point in time. Okay, so now we're back in the review process, and oh, suddenly we have sign-off. We've got sign-off. We're ready to go. We're ready to launch. Okay, so we have committed to and worked through the process of alignment throughout design, throughout build. We've launched. This is awesome. We're ready to do some measurements, some testing, some iteration. We come back to our team, and I want you to notice this guy. This guy has not been buying it. <laughs> this guy's giving her the side eye, because he's like, now it's my turn. And this guy now suddenly has, mm, you know, I actually have these analytics that I never quite brought to the table that are demonstrating or that have, have demonstrated in the past that this huge decision that you make is probably not going to work. Ah, oh, right, total power play. So here's what needs to happen then. Again, this requires you to step up and assume a level of empowerment that you may or may not feel on a day-to-day -day basis. And empowerment, actually not to be like, you know, motivational speaker or anything, but you don't have to sit around and wait for somebody to empower you, right? That starts with you. And empowerment a lot of times comes, it can come in the form of asking questions. It can come in the form of opening yourself up to listening to someone else, reflecting back to them what they're saying, and winning that trust so that you have more room to, to operate within uh, sort of larger boundaries, for example. Um, so in that instance, rather than sort of folding and saying, oh, OK, we'll go back and change it, you've got these shared facts and values that you aligned on early in the process. And you're able to come back to them and remind that person, OK, the, for example, we agreed upon the relevant facts. And this was not something that was there in that process. So we can move forward with that as a relevant fact. But here's how it's going to affect our plans and our budget and our timing and the outcomes moving and our priorities moving forward. Um, so this is, in this sense then, it doesn't just kind of become a tool of alignment, it becomes a little bit of a weapon, which is pretty awesome. Uh, so just, again, you know, sort of make sure that you've got these. And then, of course, we have the never-ending push, which is that our work is never done. We don't launch a product and say hip, hip, hooray and walk away from it. We don't launch a website. Well, we, okay, we, we're not supposed to launch a website and celebrate and walk away from it. So these are the questions that need to be asked on a regular basis, especially once we've achieved a goal or once we have uh, wrapped a project cycle. What's next and why? Methods, how can we continue to do things better together? And what's new and what's changed and what's exciting? What are our opportunities? So sometimes, no matter how hard we have worked, to sort of set these baselines. No matter how many team retreats we have had, no matter how many conversations with our client, no matter how much documentation we've provided, uh, it's inevitable that things will fall apart, that the product that we launch is broken, <clears throat> or the website that we launch 
uh, is, you know, we've just migrated all the old content from the CMS onto the website because we're going to fix it later. <laughs> um, and in those instances, that can feel like a huge obstacle. Like no matter what we do, it's never enough. And what I really want to encourage you to do uh, is that is to think about those obstacles that we feel like are dragging us down more as sort of opportunities to, uh, to embrace the process of alignment. Alignment is a really kind of creative and fluid process that can truly, truly bring your teams closer together and that creates greater purpose among individuals and among uh, different organizations. We, uh, and you can't, this is the other thing I think that I want to say, is that a lot of times we're so focused on the work that we are doing and how other people are reacting to it that we lose a sense of self-awareness that we stop reflecting on necessarily what we are bringing to the process, not only in terms of our activities and artifacts, but also in terms of our attitude and our beliefs and our values. And it is really important as we work towards finding alignment that we are clear about and realistic about uh, the opportunities that we're bringing to the table and also potentially the obstacles that we're creating and beginning to understand how we can work to remove those within ourselves. So ultimately, alignment is not about getting everybody to agree. And it's not about which feature, or which design approach, or which messaging architecture gets the most votes. And it's not about negotiation. It's not about intimidation. It's not about bribing people with donuts or delicious cake or Mexican chocolate bread pudding. That was real good, right? Alignment is really about setting a shared baseline about how we're going to operate and communicate within the design process. And it's about figuring out how we're going to make, make better decisions before we even have to start making them. Alignment doesn't stop. It's a process of working. It's a thing that we commit to with each other. It's something that we're able to create through collaboration and through honesty and through integrity. And continually working towards alignment is a deeply creative process because we all need to learn to tell more compelling stories within that process to say, here's what we're bringing to the table. Here's why these facts are compelling. Uh, here's why these, the, this is what our users are wanting, what our users are needing, the storytelling. Uh, we need to challenge our shared assumptions with one another, and we need to call each other out gently and lovingly when our actions conflict with our stated and committed values. I think that what's amazing to me about this conference, and I've been speaking here since I think 2009, uh, is that, and I was just talking to Marcy, who's at the registration desk, I was saying to her, this is an unusual crowd. And I will say too, and I've actually heard this from the other speakers, so I'm not just blowing smoke, that this is an unusual audience here in Denver. Because the level of participation that we're seeing and the smiles on faces, um, the conversations that I overhear happening in the hallway, you are already aligned together as a community in terms of wanting to build these products with real honesty and integrity. And I would suggest that uh, you all already share sort of a set of common values, uh, which are honesty, integrity, building for the user, uh, creating um, uh, positive impact for your organization and for the greater community. And so uh, I really I commend you as, a, as, as individuals. I encourage you to continue to sort of seek out those shared values with one another. And um, when you think about finding a, the kind of alignment that I think you're probably sensing just as a whole here within the conference, within your own client team or your project team or within your own organization, just remember that you actually do have the power to make that happen. So thank you very much.